Smart glasses. What's the first thing that comes to mind? Is it this? Identity or maybe it looks a little more like this. <laughs> yeah, right, you've gotta be kidding me. Maybe even this. Oh, it's the Google Glass. Oh my God. The idea of a pair of glasses with technology built right in, something that adds an additional layer of information to the world we perceive, that's not new. The reason you might have a hard time conjuring up a definitive idea of what smart glasses look like is because no one has cracked the code of how this tech should fit into everyday life. There's been attempts, sure, none of them have been great, and yet this tech keeps popping up in our culture as a future inevitability. Stand by for retinol and biometric scan. So what's taking so long? So augmented reality without any computer relationship goes certainly back to 1940s and before. For fighter pilots, it became a fairly big thing, particularly with jets. There's also uses including for lip reading with computer assist. This is Mark Weber. He's the Internet History Program Founder at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. He's also written a paper on the history of wearable computers. The next sort of big milestone is uh, virtual reality. And that was done in the late 60s by um, Ivan Sutherland and his group that had invented a lot of uh, modern computer graphics uh, starting in the early 60s with Sketchpad. So they had already done two-dimensional graphics in a sense earlier on. This was an exploration of three-dimensional graphics. How do you interact with three-dimensional objects or a three-dimensional world. So that's where the virtual reality headset came in. Spoiler alert, the device Mark is talking about is the Sword of Damocles. The name is a throwback to mythology and a reference to the fact that the headset is suspended from a large hulking frame. A dramatic name, but one fitting for the headset considered to be the beginning of both virtual and augmented reality. The helmet was big and heavy, you can see it behind me, but it was also tethered to this thing hanging above the person that was so large, obviously tied to a mini computer, which isn't going anywhere. So this is not walking out in your environment and overlaying things, but it was the beginning of, you know, the basic technology for all of this. The Sword of Damocles was a huge leap forward technologically, but no one really knew what it was supposed to be used for. Sutherland and his team built it because basically they could. The sheer hulking size didn't make any practical sense and the ideas for an AR future were limited by the current technology. To make a wearable HUD work, they'd have to wait for components to be powerful, tiny, and cheap enough to be mobile. Just because the technology wasn't there yet didn't mean people weren't already thinking of what the future might hold. That's where science fiction comes in. Augmented reality showed up in science fiction as early as the late 50s with novels like Starship Troopers. There's a line from the book that reads, I thumbed the switch for a proximity reading and read it when it flashed on the instrument reflector inside my helmet in front of my forehead. Clunky, yeah, but definitely augmented reality. Some form of AR popped up in a lot of science fiction novels after that, but movies are where we really first see what you and I probably think of as smart glasses. And if we want to talk about where it all started, we'd have to go to a galaxy far, far away. You know, the first introduction that a lot of people would have had to a heads-up display in a science fiction or cinematic context might actually be Star Wars. When Luke is doing the trench run, he has a targeting computer, and he can see the trench run in, in a more simplified format that allows him to essentially, you know, shoot into the into the fatal flaw in the Death Star, right? Great shot, kid! That was one in a million! This is Madeline Ashby. Not only is she a sci-fi novelist, she's also a futurist who has helped companies like Intel Labs design what our future tech will look like. Other examples of heads-up displays sort of in science fiction might be the way the Terminator sees. One of the most compelling aspects of the original Terminator film was that you could see from the cyborgs or from the from the Terminator's eyes. I'll be back. When we think about that, there's a long lineage of using cinema to depict what another person's vision looks like. And when we talk about what a heads-up display adds to that, it's the information that is most important to them. Fuck you, asshole. 
In these early instances, Luke and his X-Wing and the Terminator, well, terminating, we're being shown a future where information is overlaid onto our reality. It's not some cartoonish fantasy. It looks real. And that planted the idea in consumers' heads that one day, the average person might actually live in a world where this is possible. It only takes a second to dream up anything in your head. Technology? That doesn't move as fast. HUDs and sci-fi didn't stop with Star Wars and Terminator. We've seen countless examples like Mission Impossible, Minority Report, and you guessed it, Iron Man. In the real world, HUDs didn't look like this at all. There were examples like the ITAP invented by Steve Mann in the 90s and 2000s. They looked cool, but they were limited to small DIY communities and big concepts from tech brands. Compare that to the AR glasses in movies, it just doesn't add up. You wouldn't wear an eye tap in public. Tony Stark's glasses? Way more subtle. Sci-fi paints a picture of these glasses fitting into our everyday life. That, in turn, shaped our expectations. They create sort of a, an ideal vision. They create a vision of what might be possible. And that's sort of the science fiction writer's privilege. You know, we can write about what we think is possible without having to do all the legwork of actually designing it. We write the wish list. Someone else has to fulfill it. Guys, uh, we, we're going to do, we're we're do something pretty magical here. And we have a special surprise for you. This can go wrong <laughs> in about 500 different ways. So tell me now, who wants to see a demo of glass? This is right when smartphones were just kind of taking off like crazy. It was easy to believe that, you know, this is just, oh, it's the next step. And of course, Google at that point you know, could do no wrong. It was rising again tremendously. Android was tremendously successful. I think a lot of it was just thinking these are big, important companies that uh, have not made too many mistakes. A serious effort by Google, you know, at least has a good chance of succeeding. And I mean, the product itself is very cute. The hype was real, fam. Is that Google? Is that Google? Is that Google? Is that Google? Is that Google thing? We hadn't seen anything like this from such a big name before. Google Glass looked like it was plucked straight out of science fiction. But the bigger the hype, the bigger the crash. Tonight, not everybody is comfortable when somebody's wearing Google Glass in their presence. 82% of Americans don't want to buy Google Glass. Uh, they're concerned about privacy. They're uh, concerned about uh, potential invasiveness. The glass Kyle Russell was confronted in a coffee shop. Yelled glass and grabbed the Google Glass off my face and sprinted away. I think the, the issues that the Google Glass experience when it was first launched were twofold. One was um, kind of just the way it looked. Like you were, you really literally had a piece of tech hanging off your face. These aren't my words, but I heard it called like a segue for your face, <laughs> uh, which is probably a little harsh. This is Chuck Eust. He's a designer with Frog Design and has plenty of experience working on AR and VR headsets. People are super selective when it comes to their glasses, right? Or anything that has, um, it's, it's gonna be on their face. And I think um, there was a reaction to that. One problem with designing smart glasses is that everybody's face and vision are different. You and I can buy the same pair of glasses, but we have different prescriptions and facial measurements. Glass was the same manufactured design for everyone and it looked dorky. That's the thing about glasses. They say a lot about your personal style. For instance, I have these glasses when I want to feel comfortable and these for when I want to feel stylin'. We're humans, we're incredibly vain. Looking good is a huge part of what glasses you choose to wear. Uh, the second part is um, people reacting to being filmed all the time and having cameras. Smart glasses to me are the easiest way to observing people in a private, in what they think is a private environment. And that's why they show up in spy movies. It's why Ethan Hunt always has a pair of, of glasses that are always photographing everything. So they didn't think hard enough about the reaction of kind of ordinary people that thought they were being filmed. We all know the term glass hole that was applied to uh, the kind of people that would wear it into a bar and that sort of thing. And you know, even though logically we know that a smartphone has a camera, and you have a very good sense if someone's filming you with a smartphone. It's harder with a headset because there's not, not as many cues. But, you know, the, the immediate default assumption is that you could be filmed without your knowledge. By creating a specific image of how smart glasses fit into our lives, sci-fi might have inadvertently set up this tech for failure. I think science fiction does both things. It both 
it feeds us the wrong information a lot. You know, I bring up the example of like these transparent screens that we're constantly seeing. Those would be so hard to look at on a daily basis. And for the movies, they're basically so that you can see the actors better through the screens. So that's pushing us wrong information, I think. And two, uh, it is pushing things forward. We're seeing, you know, a lot of the stuff that we saw in Star Trek, we're now using, you know, with our cell phones and translating things on the fly. Spock. Spock. With all the sacrifices to style, privacy, and your wallet, the lack of a real reason to buy the thing was ultimately what led to its failure. At least with regular Joes like you and me. But that doesn't mean smart glasses are dead. They're alive and actually thriving for enterprises. <laughs>